<laughs> okay, so let's um, let's go ahead and get started uh, this afternoon. Uh, so it's a pleasure uh, to have with us here today uh, Corey Evans uh, from Rice University. Uh, so he uh, he got his uh, bachelor's in marine biology at Nova Southeastern, and then did a PhD um, with. Uh, uh, James Albert at uh, University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Then did a, a postdoc at the University of Minnesota with Andrew Simmons, and another one at Brown University with Beth, with Beth Brainerd. Uh, a lot of his uh, early work focused on freshwater ecosystems, particularly uh, in the uh, Amazon. And he is a evolutionary biologist that. Uh, specializes in complex trait evolution. Uh, he uh, studies how environmental and developmental factors influence uh, patterns of trait diversification, particularly in one of the coolest structures uh, in all of biology, which is the skull of fishes. Um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, I met Corey this summer doing field work dump. Pulled up uh, at the dock in a local fishing boat with like fishing poles and like a chest full of fish. And I, I like originally thought it's like, it's like, oh, like, you know, just some cat coming out, like doing some fishing on vacation. And then he was like at the station again next day with like a spear gun. And it's just like, all right, like clearly he's not on vacation. Um, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have him here today. And uh, to talk about uh, his his work on the interplay of innovation and, and integration uh, in uh, fish uh, skeletal morphology, and um, this is actually the first time as a faculty member he's ever given an in-person seminar because he started his career just as the world shut down. So um, nice to have that as a first uh, for you. So thank you for being here, Corey. Uh, thanks. Yeah, uh, so hello everybody, my name is Corey Evans, and today we'll be talking about uh, evolutionary mosaics in the ancient way between inspiration and innovation. Uh, we'll be going through kind of two really fun case studies in fishing, the best of the uh, uh, to show you kind of how uh, patterns of trade variation can affect uh, downstream patterns of evolutionary innovation. All right, so uh, whenever I do these talks, uh, I like to start off with a thought exercise to orient the audience uh, and kind of give the audience an idea of how I approach uh, certain systems and the kinds of questions that I definitely ask. Uh, so in your seats, uh, I want you guys to all kind of imagine uh, this African male lion. And there's a reason why I think male lion. I want you to get a picture of this animal in your head. Uh, think about its coming and going, how it's spending its time, is it that it's chilling? Like, what does this lion do um, kind of on a day to day? <laughs> or more specifically, uh, more, more specifically ask that what is, what is a typical height that this male had like? And as a creative anatomist, the next question that I will ask is what is it using the skull for? So start thinking about how this line might be using its skull uh, in this day to day activity. So as a creative anatomist, the next thing that we would do, or the next thing that I would do, is get that line, snatch the skull out of its head, and start asking the hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> So we know that for burgers in general, one of the primary functions of the skull is to protect and house the sense of cast. So this is your eyes, your ears, your nose. Uh, and male lines in particular spend a very large portion of their time sensing their environment. Uh, they are uh, walking around using their gates to work and sniff out their mates and potential rivals while also they prey. They can then <laughs> tell other lines to get <laughs> to go get and say that they're fine. But yeah, male lines are constantly sensing their environment. So this is a really important function. Of the skull, it's not just unique lines. Uh, this is one of the earliest functions of the skull in birds. Next, I told you they don't really do that much hunting, but on occasion, the male lions would get uh, brought in to bring down large game, like this kid up. As you can see, our friend here is hanging on to this buffalo with its face for deer line. Uh, so, this is the second function of the skull. Uh, if, if these lions are lucky, they flip this buffalo, put the death grip on it, uh, and uh, try to eat it. Uh, so, you now have two functions for the skull. It's protecting the housing and sensory capsules, and then pretty capture and processing. Now, the reason why I think male lions is because they have this other aspect of their natural history uh, where they engage in intraspecific 
aggressive interaction. So as you can see, uh, these lines are going to tell them each other's faces uh, what they calls. And I can tell you that if one of us gets shot to the face by one of these lions, uh, we would, uh, none of us would be standing. Um, and yet these lions give each other a mix uh, with very few questions uh, because their skulls aren't reinforced and their muscles are reinforced to absorb those blows. So that goes to about three functions, right? We can imagine through these uh, functions as independent vectors of selection that are exerting pressure uh, across the skull. And I've included the fourth term here, which is phylogeny, uh, because phylogeny is a history of how the skulls respond to something so like the question in the past, and it provides a roadmap from the response to the So uh, as we just saw, this is a very easy thought exercise, because we have to know quite a bit about money. We know that when they're young, they hang out in the jungles uh, with their future friends, and sometimes they're going to be Beyonce, and you know. Um, and other times, they go to Juilliard and they dance and hang out with Chris Rock, Jim, and Smith, and dance with Um But we happen to know a lot less about other groups, which we'll be touching on in a bit. So, the focus on my lab today is uh, we we're really focus on the evolution of innovation and how, uh, really, how interesting how this shows evolve. So, uh, what is an evolutionary innovation? An evolutionary innovation is a novel trait or function that allows an animal to do or an organism to do something that was uh, previously unavailable to them before. Uh, some examples of evolutionary innovation include powered flight. Uh, basically, once an organism falls powered flight, it gains access to airspace. Uh, so, the birds of the wild powered flight, so now they can fly around and squawk at us uh, at our dumpsters and stuff. Uh, tube snouts, really, uh, really charismatic. Evolutionary evolution innovation is my favorite. Uh, because they, they basically allow an animal to, to stick its face in a place that it uh, previously was unable to put its face. Uh, so these are some examples of evolutionary innovations. In some rare cases, these innovations can even lead to increased rates of speciation, although that's a bit more uh, So I'm not the first person to be that interested in evolutionary innovations. This, uh, evolutionary innovations have really captivated biologists for over a century. And a lot of the focus has been on some of the environmental factors of the extrinsic factors of evolutionary innovation. Uh, and there's been lots of focus on some of the organism properties that might facilitate patterns of total preservation. However, over the past 10 years, uh, we've actually learned a lot about some of the uh, organismal properties that might structure patterns of uh, trait variance in total preservation. Uh, primarily looking at patterns of trait for variation in development and cross species. So I'll be talking about two very important. Of variation, and I'll be explaining their downstream evolutionary possibilities. The first case we'll be talking about today is this really fun case called integration. So, integration occurs when there's a high degree of co variation uh, between traits or trait patterns, such that uh, changes that occur here via mutation are changes that occur in one trait via mutation are expected to be reflected uh, in other traits that are connected by underlying biotropic uh, gene signaling. Yeah. So, uh, if the mutation occurs in trait one, we expect to see it uh, reflect the pretty strong traits. The next case is uh, trait modularity. So, modularity of first plants looks like the opposite of integration. However, I would argue that it's actually a special piece of integration. So, if you look at, uh, if we focus on trait one here, as you can see, uh, most of the kind of uh, subtraits and uh, sub, sub little nodes are actually fairly integrated. So, the mutation occurs in here in trait one. It gets fairly evenly distributed within that, within that kind of trait context. However, uh, you don't necessarily expect to see uh, the flood in trait 2, and that's because there's a breakdown in signaling, resulting in a modular signal or a kind of modularization of the spec. Um, so these are the two, uh, two cases we'll be discussing today, and now I'll explain their macro evolutionary consequences. So, at back evolutionary time scales, evolutionary, evolutionary information is uh, so it's thought to constrain rates of evolution due to something called efficient parameters. So basically, as trait complexes become more and more integrated and grow some complex form of traits, it becomes more difficult to find mutations that are beneficial across all those traits. This will reduce rates of more complex evolution uh, because it just creates so much, uh, basically it creates uh, so much weight and it's really hard to move all the traits all at once. Uh, so I like this to be here about the bagwing scenario where this woman's trying to catch the bus, but she has all this luggage, so she's moving really slow, so in order to catch, but she has to let go of some of her luggage. That is how I like it, evolutionary integration, uh, and this is like one great evolution. However, integration is not all that. Uh, sometimes it's really important to integrate your traits if they all serve a similar function. So here we have a zebra, 
Zebras are quadruped mammals, which means they walk on all their limbs. And science has shown that quadrupeds have duplicated all of their remnants so that all their remnants are the same kind of relative uh, length, which is really important. If you have modularity in your limbs, uh, you will find it really, really difficult to get right to you with MR line in the military example, uh, because all your limbs would be different lengths, maybe one would be a surfboard, and the zebra would be a little cool, uh, but it wouldn't get very far. So sometimes integration is really, really important. In the case of evolution in modularity, uh, we see it, it gets a lot of attention because it's actually thought to facilitate morphological diversification and not so much. So basically, as traits become more and more modularized, they're able to mount independent uh, responses to static pressures. So this can result in morphological diversification and specialization across the body of the organism. So if, uh, if zebras are quadrupeds, Kobe Ryan was certainly a biped, and he did all his little money on his hind limbs, which frees four limbs up. To dunk balls, which threes and involve your space. Uh, so, <laughs> studies have shown that five people mammals are indeed more modularized than mammals. So, as you notice, uh, most of our examples at this point have actually come from uh, tetrapod systems. Right? I'm a fish person and I haven't really mentioned fish at all this time. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, most of what we know about uh, the intervention modularity of vertebrate systems comes from these tetrapod systems birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. Um, and there's a reason for that. One, they're very well, uh, very well represented in collections, they're larger, easier to image. Um, and in some ways, they're, it's just more known about them. However, if you want to learn about the, the, what the full story of bird revolution, and in my case, the full story of bird and skull, you really need to be looking at fishes, because fishes comprise over half of all bird diversity, um, and that's why skulls are being much better as well. So yeah, this kind of session. So yeah, Telios, in particular, super diverse, uh, and especially with these cells, are probably uh, probably more than one of this group of social qualities and all the other work we just talked about. And I'm not just throwing that out there, they are doing some really insane things with their cells. So here we have an exron image of a large amount of mass subject. So this is one of the cool things of Telios with their cells. So as you watch this vast uh, stripe at a Object that is on screen, but how many bones move as a standard of this number? If you sit in your seats, I need your mask and open your face, you know, and you can count how many bones move, and the answer is one. Uh, with two last measures, that, that's not the case. Uh, some some uh, fishes have uh, up to 20, maybe 24 mobile elements in their skulls, and at the time of feeding, they're made by this really complex system of uh, muscles, tendons, and ligaments. Uh, which is really cool. And it also means that the TLS fish law is one of the most complex biological structures. So, one of the TLS groups we're talking about today is a group that's very near to the heart. Uh, these are the grasses. This is a very charismatic group of coral reef fishes. They're uh, ecologically diverse, morphologically diverse, and uh, in, many, in many cases, like downright dual. Uh, they also are very well represented uh, genetically, and we have to know quite a bit about their uh, ecology as well, which makes them a really interesting system to study of the sharing of vision. When it comes to rasses, rasses are packed, uh, packed full of genetic uh, One of their more famous innovations is this thing called French Mappy, uh, where these fishes have all the sites of the jaws and the that actually fuse their jaws together into this very robust state that allows them to crush hard prey. So these animals that have sex in their jaws, like aliens, uh, they swim up, ingest a snail, then crush it up in their throat and swallow. Um, so this is a really impressive and interesting condition. And uh, some masses later on in this image are actually efficiently modified the sex that are jaws and some really cool things. Another thing that grasses have done is well, <laughs> what I call like that essential feeding. Uh, so they're able to launch their face like Halfway across the screen, they catch it, catch it in basic place. They've done some pretty crazy things with their skulls. And again, this is the equivalent of like you walking into your kitchen, sitting in the doorway, saying like a hot chia on the kitchen counter, <laughs> not moving, and just throwing your mouth at it really fast. It's crazy. This isn't like throwing your tongue at something. This is these are bones that are flying <laughs> off this fish's face and coming back. Um, so this thing got rats like a little sheath made out of its nasal to bring the uh, to bring the spot that uh, pronounced it back. It's pretty impressive. However, I would argue that the most impressive evolutionary innovation in lasses actually belongs to bird fishes. Uh, so, and I, and I, and I believe it's a great fishes. So, lots of birds have evolved beasts. You know, dinosaurs have beasts, turtles have beasts, 
there might be some other group of vertebrates that flies around that have feet as well. Uh, but I've argued that uh, there's really no weak point like the parafish. For starters, uh, the parafish beef is composed of one of the strongest biological uh, materials on the planet, and it has a really interesting kind of construction. So here, if you actually scan it, scan it into a parafish beef, x rays and x rays, scan it, you'll see that it's composed of a bunch of teeth that are tiny teeth that are slotted together. This is really uniform morphology. Each one of these teeth is incredibly tough and incredibly strong. Uh, it's about uh, as strong as a uh, chitin tooth in the shell. Uh, so you might be asking, why does an animal need teeth that are this strong? And the answer for our friendly pair of fish lies in the diet. Right. Yeah. So here we have a beautiful pair of fish that is uh, munching on coral. That is the majority of their diet for this species uh, of pair of fish. If you want hard coral and hard coral skeletons, uh, with the intention of targeting the cyanobacteria that they eat inside the coral skeletons. Uh, so these animals, as you can imagine, uh, feed on a very nutritionally poor resource. Uh, so they spend all day grazing and, and pooping. Uh, and so if you're going to slam your face in the hard rocks all day long, you, you need a really, really tough structure uh, for the rocks. Uh, so, uh, as you can imagine, if you were to go outside and ingest a rock, uh, you might be able to get the rock into your, into your mouth. You might even be able to swallow it, uh, but you would have some problems dealing with that rock downstream, uh, so to speak. Uh, the fishes have solved this problem as well. So they've modified that, that seven set of jaws in their throat into this really uh, very complex mill like structure uh, that allows them to actually grind up that coral into a nice fine white powder, which is then excrete uh, over the reef or over divers. So you're probably thinking Corey came all the way from Houston to LA to show those videos of uh, parrotfish pooping on people. Why is he doing that? Why is he like this? And my answer to that is I'm really into parrotfish poop because parrotfish poop is not like any other poop that we that we ever really experienced. Uh, so one parrotfish can produce about 450 kilograms of poop every year, and this poop uh, actually this poop is the uh, basis for a lot of white sand beaches and tropical islands, especially places like Hawaii. So next time you see a beautiful white sand beach on Michigan for their heart, play the parrotfish. Um, and this is why I think the parrotfish beat is such an important innovation. It's basically one group of asses got them the weird, they've all been beat, and now we have white sand beaches. So, I don't know, like, call me when we're done that. So, where did this beat come from? So, as I keep mentioning, parrotfishes are grasses, which means they've evolved from within grasses, which means they evolved from fishes that did not have beaks. Uh, so here we have a basic kind of last lower jaw. I uh, highlighted two bones over here from uh, this portion of the top. So this is the denary bone in purple, and this is the angular bone in green. Uh, so the denary bone bears all the teeth. That's the one that we usually see uh, when we're looking at two D vertebrates. And so yeah, so parrotfishes evolved from a uh, parrotfish jaw evolved from a, a morphology of the front of it like this. And what's really cool about parrotfish is that not all species have beaks. Uh, so there's an old clay parrotfish called seagrass clay, where instead of having beaks, they coalesce a bunch of small teeth over the margin of the uh, And as we see there on the stock, in a lot of ways, these uh, seagrass parrotfishes resemble wrasses more than they resemble some of our more uh, well known parrotfishes. Things get especially interesting in parrotfishes because uh, recent. Recent analyses out of my lab show that they've actually made, they may have even evolved, evolved beaks twice in the end. So here within the seagrass uh, we have a set, we have kind of the second evolution of beaks in the ocean, it's fair summer, uh, where they again have coalesced the teeth using this really, really weird morphology. We can see this data has gotten fairly, uh, it's, it's become fairly robust. This angular bone is actually barely recognizable, and this, this depth this is clearly a structure that's used now for spraying and crushing particle cells. When we pop over to what's called the full reef clay, uh, we can see that the structure is even more robust. So this is the lower jaw that belongs to that crushing parrotfish in the video before. You can see now that this, this animal now has a gigantic flange that overlaps the, uh, the angular bone. Uh, the uh, adductive and midway muscle is actually attached to the front of this flange of the So, this is a very robust structure uh, that is definitely used for crushing as well. What's cool about parrotfish is that after they, after they evolved beaks, they didn't really stop there. Instead, uh, they further modified the beak to feed on corals in many different ways. So that, uh, so that parrotfish that we saw earlier, 
with the notion of uh, explaining the discrete beam checks out of the uh, correspondence. Other pair of fishes, um, okay. so some pair of fishes have kind of uh, shrunk it down that memory bubble, and instead of opening up space between the memory and the anchor bubble, and the bubble is like instead of joint, a second joint in the jaw, but the intron and the anchor jaw. This allows for more function uh, during the feeding process, and uh, sites have shown that the spring pair of fishes feed significantly faster than that to the pair of fish. so they're able to feed more quickly uh, as the meat muscle feeds. So this is kind of a really uh, interesting um, example of the modern innovation, and then further modifying it later on in the evolution history of the So the roadmap for the rest of this portion of the talk will be centered on two main questions. One, was the evolution of the parapet be a gradual process, or was uh, or did it result in an increase in the rates of more black uh, So this will be looking at so taking the rates perspective, looking at the evolution. Second, uh, what role did integrity and evolutionary expression on the play during the evolution of uh, the as, as I kind of mentioned before, uh, modularity sounds like sensitive morphological classification. So, did the animal with their vision modularize in the amoebic or uh, is something else? So, in order to answer this question, we took a 3D genetic approach uh, where we microscopically scanned uh, now we broke about 220 species. But at the time, we stopped together, we were in 166. So we micro CT scanned a bunch of rascals at Friday Harbor, University of Chicago, uh, University of Washington, and Rice University uh, under the Back at RASAP Staining Initiative. Very proud of that name. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and it's cool we created all these, uh, all these 3D models of rascals. It's actually open source, available for anybody if you guys want to play with rascals. Next, we isolated the uh, the anatomy of interest, so here we just the lower jaw for this particular uh, study. Uh, so we just isolated two bumps of the light, and then we took a 3D geometric morphological approach, uh, which allows us to multiply shape variation uh, across the upper structures. So we just put a couple landmarks on the lower jaw uh, to compare shapes to different species. Next, uh, I mentioned that paraphrase time would be determined in the joint. If you're studying uh, skull shape variation um, across articulated elements, when they should impose, in the same position, so that was just uh, kind of an extra step that we took to ensure that we weren't uh, getting uh, a bunch of boys from rotating joints. Next, we estimated rates of shape evolution uh, using base traits. I'm not really going to go into, uh, into too much explanation for methods, but if you have any questions, uh, please ask me after the talk. Uh, we fed a couple of different models of uh, trait evolution to our data, and we found a strong support for a variable rates Brownian motion model across the skull. So, this actually shows that. Across grasses, uh, there are variable rates of jaw shape evolution, you just don't know where it ends. Next, uh, we, this is the file I can use, we see AL, the Yale over on the ocean. If you're studying evolution and you're not using phylogeny, you might have a bad time. And lastly, we quantified uh, integration modularity between the denary and the angular bone using a couple of different metrics that I won't be going into. And if you have questions, uh, so, let's get into some of our results. Here I'm showing you a file home space analysis. Uh, so, in a file home space, uh, basically what we're showing is how the species uh, traits, uh, the distribution of species traits relative to And what's cool about our home space is here, each dot corresponds to the species, uh, species name, and the lines uh, connected with dots uh, correspond to the, their phylogenetic relationship. So, this shows whether or not uh, closer to the species cluster together. Or this is or this is cluster together, and whether or not it's a much of uh, So here we have the coral we put a uh, pair of fishes uh, colored in red. We have that, that weird, sometimes beadless uh, seagrass clay colored in green. And as you can see, for our coral feeding, uh, coral reclaimed pair of fishes, they really colonize completely novel meeting chip space. So what's interesting is that in our seagrass clay, uh, especially the, spe the species that don't have bees, they have a lot of quantity of like grasses. This is, uh, this is really interesting because there's, all, there's been this argument for like 20 years as to whether or not pair of fishes should be their own families and whether or not pair of fishes should be more logically distinct than other grasses. But like half of pair of fishes are still in the last few grasses. Um, so it's really, it's, this is a really fun thing. One of the cool things about geometrical metrics is that we're able to break apart traits and analyze them separately. So here we have the denary, that was the denary belt. You can see that pattern of morphosis uh, occupation even more clearly. 
um, and the two very bones. So here, our coral reef plane again is out there by itself. Nothing's really approaching it. Uh, and then that seagrass plate is in, once again occupying the very intermediate position uh, between the uh, full-blown coral feeding bear fishes and some of the like mackerel or seagrass plate. <laughs> when we look at the angular bone, we do not get a clear signal. Uh, this angular bone is not behaving in our following space analysis, and it probably is not in the uh, But right now, uh, things are really, really chaotic in, in angular land. However, you do see that uh, some of that, some of those seagrass uh, pair of fishes have a lot of pretty distinct angular uh, morphology. So what about rates? So here I'm showing you a lesson where I scale uh, the following slide simply. Now, scale of the branch cells by the rate of shape evolution. So, long branches correspond to fast rates, short ranges correspond to slow rates. Uh, and I'm not even going to compare this yet. Let's take a walk around this uh, mass tree. This is, there's a lot of stuff happening. So, for starters, that slung water grass that I showed you earlier, this is down in this case, that Cheeto, things like that. This pattern, this business is certainly fast. This is the fastest rate that we have in the entire analysis. Perhaps, surprisingly, this is a very weird end. Next. Bird grasses have been evolving really, really long snouts, are also evolving really quickly. Grasses in general, the display right here, grasses have actually evolved these like four diamonds and kind of thing. Uh, and this is one of the other beef clays, the um, southern ocean really fast. And when we get to our pair fishes uh, with the poor related red and sea grass plate and green again, uh, we find a really interesting pattern. So we first find what's called a bi, what I call a biphasic shift in rates of tree evolution. So at the base, all pair of here, we find a pretty significant shift. And then when we get to the whole reef plate, we find a second shift. So basically, uh, the beak that we see in the whole reef plate pair fishes uh, evolved with kind of a biphasic shift in rates of When we look at just the memory, we find the same policy pattern. Things that were fast with the entire job are fast still. When we look at the angular, despite the angular uh, acting wild and crazy in our global space, we do generally find the same policy pattern, except we don't really find that biophasic shift in, uh, in the coral reef plate. But for all the other masses, uh, the pattern is quite the same. So, this biophasic shift is actually an interesting finding uh, because this, this isn't the first time we've seen it. Uh, my colleagues and I, in a, in a study in 2019, looked at rates of shift evolution in fringing uh, jobs and masses. We found that the same characteristic biophasic shift. In pair of fishes at the base, and then again at the coral reef plate as they evolve to eat coral and elongate that to the male. So it looks like uh, multiple traits that are associated with diet are uh, following similar evolutionary trajectories and similar patterns in the rates of trade evolution, which is really interesting. Which leads us to our kind of overarching question about integration of modular. So we quantified evolutionary integration between the generator bone and the angular bone. And uh, first, we looked at it across all classes. And what we found is that shift changes are tightly integrated between these two bones, uh, evolution and class masses. Uh, there are some outliers, uh, notably our friend the bird grass again, with that really long snap. Bird grasses, just to the side, they're really cool that they've evolved the elongate energy while leaving their angular bone very grass like. So there's a bit of a coupling uh, between the two bones in its lineage. But in general, most masses are fairly integrated in their own. In their uh, world of evolution. When we look at pair fishes, we actually find the exact same pattern. Uh, so, generally, pair fishes are also highly integrated in their uh, world jaws, uh, which is uh, which was a surprise. So, if you remember before, I mentioned that evolution integration starts with strain rates, which are evolution due to some of the competition. However, in the case of pair fish, we find the matter rates of jaw shape evolution. In the presence of the shock integration. Uh, so, how's this happening? And where are we seeing So, uh, we look to our friends and birds, uh, we see uh, studies have shown we will be shown certain patterns of integration that date back to, uh, to our disorders um, across the skull, despite the fact that uh, we know the birds have uh, undergone really variable rates and high rates of skull shape or uh, skull shape evolution. Uh, so, it looks like birds are also evolving really, really quickly in the presence of shock integration. And it looks like our uh, previous hypothesis of integration constraint rates of uh, normal evolution isn't really holding up. So, what's actually happening? So, there is a special case where, uh, called evolutional lines of phenotypic resistance, uh, these phenotypic resistance where, uh, where uh, trait integration can actually facilitate 
rather than it's more fun and blood issue. And this occurs when it's effectively beneficial to the insulin in traits. So, uh, as I mentioned before, when you integrate it, if you change one trait, you change multiple traits at the same time. And as long as this isn't selectively uh, deleterious, uh, you can actually completely change the very, very rapidly, um, as long as it's uh, selectively beneficial. So, using this special case, animals are able to launch themselves across the multiple space by changing multiple traits you know, occurring in time. So, we think this is a lot of good. So when they kiss the case of parrotfishes, they eat hard coral. So if you're eating hard coral, you kind of want all your drinks to be on the same page. You don't want a strong beak with like a weak sex that it does, because it adjusts the coral and you can crush it up, vice versa. So when you're feeding on this really specialized uh, food resource, it might be really important to integrate all your traits. So to conclude, uh, for this part of the talk, uh, we found that the young should be very deep. Allow grasses to expand into this uh, fluidly new unoccupied uh, like shape space uh, that results in the rapid rates of uh, rapid rates of shape evolution. And we found that this uh, this diversification and innovation that could be the presence of really, really tight evolutionary innovation. So for some future directions, uh, we did not set the peak. Uh, we're currently working on a full uh, skull data set, um, and we've actually uh, now, now we're setting some review, and we found some really interesting patterns. We found uh, strong patterns of input variation, and the fungal jobs, which form an element module, uh, which might explain why they have similar patterns of uh, trade evolution and similar rate, uh, rate patterns as well. And we're actually able to pair rates of shape evolution across now about 10 to 14 bones in the rest of the and we're not going to stop grasses. Uh, we're also putting together a scope data set, you know, a uh, full perpendicular to carry data set as well. So look at these broad scale patterns of the evolution So the, uh, the next uh, case study we'll be looking at is another group of fishes that I'm really, really passionate about um, for other reasons. <laughs> and, we'll be, and we'll be looking at how uh, integration is played a role in the evolution of flatfish asymmetry. So, let's talk about the carrying areas or current deformities, depending on their uh, problem. So, uh, this is one of the outer and most morphologically morphological diverse clades of vertebrates on the planet. It includes some very, very charismatic fishes, including things like billfish, mahi mahi, barracudas, remoras, all these really, really charismatic morphologic fishes, and also taste pretty good. Um, and uh, this group is fairly special because they're thought to have rapidly more about the carriers planet. About 60 60 years ago, after the first time, and we got some really, really weird fish out of it. So, in addition to having to be uh, good tasting and polite guys, uh, the carrot barrier also featured one of the weirdest birds on the planet, uh, which are black fishes. So, black fishes is the most extreme case of okay, asymmetry in the world, uh, where one eye fits my to the other side of the head, resulting in a fish that has two eyes on one side and no eyes on the other side. If you were to flip, our friend Clover, which you also find, is that there's no pigment. All of the underside of the side is not finished. Completely, uh, completely white and painted there. Uh, so these species are incredibly asym uh, asymmetrical, very asymmetrical with brain morphology, fluid morphology, you name it. All of are very asymmetrical and very precise. Despite this, uh, there are about 800 uh, species of flatfish worldwide. They're absurdly diverse in their uh, species numbers and in the sedentary colonies. Uh, so this so this uh, coin fish is doing really well, despite being absolutely horrible. So how does one become a flatfish? Right? Like how do we get? So what's really interesting about flatfish is that when they're born, they actually start off symmetrical. So they look like every other fish uh, when they're born with both eyes, with either eye, either eye and the other side of the body. However, shortly after birth, or shortly after hatching, one eye will begin to migrate to the other side of the head. Resulting in an So, if you thought your puberty was bad, imagine how much you It's absolutely important. What's perhaps more interesting, uh, what's perhaps more interesting, is the evolutionary history of flatfishes. So, similar to the development, uh, flatfishes evolved from species of ancestors and then gradually migrated their eyes to the seven bodies, uh, which we have fossil patterns. So, flatfishes are that very case of reintegration, where their ontology does come back. 
So for this talk, we're going to be answering basically the same uh, same sets of questions that we did in our last data set. We'll be looking at the role of integration during the application uh, or platform. Uh, so we again took a three dimensional application approach. This ended up being really important uh, because we needed to capture the uh, asymmetry. They're creating in this, in this case uh, using three dimensions uh, because it's a super warped structure that's uh, again asymmetric on one side and uh, we need a three dimensions. In this case, we've done 102 species, um, with about 60 more catfishes, and 49 non catfish followers. Uh, they don't perform their own way, uh, so we just call them non catfish. In this case, we uh, want to focus on the paracranium. The paracranium houses a lot of sensor structures and captures the important, uh, which is going to be really important for figuring out where that eye is going to be uh, in evolution time. So, <laughs> the fun thing about catfishes, is that some of them are asymmetrical on the right hand side, and some of them are asymmetrical on the left hand side. So if you're analyzing shape, and you have one skull that faces that way, and the other that faces that way, you will absolutely collapse all of your shape analysis. Uh, so we figure out a way to invert some of our flatfish skulls, making them all face the right way, which I thought was just a super cool thing uh, that we were able to do. Next, like the progresses, we the shape evolution, and again, we'll be found child support. For a model where the rates vary across the different branches in the carrying area of the model. And in this case, we use the repair model. Next, uh, we, we fit a couple models of uh, uh, integration of Larry to get their range of data set. We found strong support for a six module hypothesis, breaking apart the cell in the same function. So, so here I'm showing you a principle of analysis uh, where I plotted uh, all the numbers on the skull and colored them by their, uh, by their degree of shape variance. So red colors correspond to areas with a high degree of variance, and blue colors correspond to areas with low degree of shape variance. So as you can see, if we just look at the uh, this side here, as we look at this side here, most of the variance is concentrated on the back end of that color. Uh, and there's a reason why. There are 61 catfishes in this data <laughs> set, and they are tracking this really interesting pattern of asymmetry across the fish. So, the most important aspect of shape variance in carrying variance is almost entirely global. However, uh, this data set includes the sort of fishes that are good at, and yet the quarter percent of the variance is already flat fish, which is like not a fish. We get a PC2, it's mostly sold at the uh, with uh, the stress of the press. So when we look at our analysis analysis, this pattern is quite So you can see that flock fishes have really colonized their own region of shape space. Nothing else is getting close to them. And they've, they've pushed some very morphologically disparate fishes into water on the other side of the shape space. So again, there's like more of them there. That's a swordfish. That's a very good. They're all being stuck together. This flock fish is so weird. So when we look at rates, and we find more interesting silver. So again, uh, carrying variance is done. Rapidly multiplying the rest of the binary with the shut. So you can see at a place, play here, a really strong branch. So here I colored the uh, branches of the tree by the very shape of the tree, so especially in the rest of them. So red colors correspond to fast rates, blue colors correspond to slow rates. So again, at the onset of carrying area, boom, we're here, we're very fast. However, three, about three million years later, we get flatfishes. And flatfishes uh, involve a fully asymmetrical body only three million years after the planet fish came which is pretty impressive. Uh, so here you can see flatfishes off the charts in terms of the rate of ship But we find some uh, smaller sort of ships uh, going for the uh, But it looks like uh, flatfishes evolve their asymmetry because of the rat. Interestingly, when we uh, quantify the degree of integration, between the flatfish and the non-flatfish, we find that uh, flatfishes are significantly more integrated uh, than their normal control. Uh, so it looks like the evolutionary uh, transitionary structure is rapid, and we kind of have integration across the range. And we see this pattern when we look at the rates of uh, shape evolution across the system. So here, instead of coloring our landmarks by the degree of variance uh, uh, for a custom analysis, I've colored them by the rate of shape evolution. 
So as you can see, most of these, uh, most of these form actually involve the correct symbol limits, uh, save for the uh, correct schema here. And this is because there's a strong matter of integration uh, amongst our published ones. They're uh, coming all the integrations together. So again, uh, integrations will need to be trained, pattern form mode and specification, but we're not seeing that package. Again, we're trying to put these animals in the back of the image of the first body and there's an interface with the original information. So again, how does this happen? In this case, I think the answer can actually be that. So for flatfishes, during that uh early there are a lot of changes that are happening all across the body associated with this injury, but it's not really just relegated to the body. So much of the body is changes have a round and a lot of that really the biggest length process is more than four countries. And kind of our human eye actually goes on the eye will be so much of the changes. Uh, and we know that the flatfish uh, allows the flat flatfish autonomy to be the same So the integration at the master net level might also be being considered at the college. So to conclude, well, we found that carrier in that way will have the first one after the two shut, uh, single throws, flatfish is laterally engaged, and kind of contact as well. Fully is kind of a lot of plans, but we found that this will be rapid transition, a highly integrated. And some future uh, directions, we're just looking at uh, some more logical patterns and then flat issues. That's for uh, patterns of the future. With that, questions? In the flat issues, you know, they might have a vertical jaw. The mouth is vertical. Yeah, sometimes, yes. Okay. Are there any advantages to that, or is that that to be more the activity? So there are some different indications. Uh, so one indication might be that the jaws are probably contracting, such that maybe the regulation is going to be a little bit off. I have shown this way to make it simple. There are some flat issues that make it simple about the jaws. They're definitely the gas, most of the jaws are still on the ground. But it looks like they might be Yes. Or the uh, two four part. Um, have you given thought to how the uh, the functional transition to go from the uh, four bar to the six bar and the sun job? Like how how do you uh, how do you get there and how does it all work? Yeah, so how do you get there is really <laughs> uh, um, it's a function of uh, uh that whole water all the way to super You don't have a bridge at the end uh step between this and the rest. So, I haven't really thought about, <laughs> I thought too much because there's so many ways I could have done it. Um, but I wonder if, and I do suspect the integration that I'm going to do. But if it's having this, the way that this is possible to set up, uh, so much of the world is going to get it to modify it, that it seems very likely that there are all these integrations. Yeah, I think it's like, okay, they can use all the other things that we look at. Yeah, it looks like a So it seems to me that two things that are um, most important are structures that are holy and flat fishes have in common is that they're uh, basically going to novel motor spaces and novel model spaces. So do you think that there's sort of a correlation between being highly integrated and being able to kind of break these novel species and motor spaces? And then once the motor spaces have been colonized, they might be better to be more modular and to fully exploit that. Yes, I actually think that we uh, think that being integrated is super important to all kinds of technology issues. Because again, we don't have one very good system, so we can get there and uh, But as for kind of breaking down our intention, I think that uh, it's simply possible. So what we've seen is kind of a combination of better and different forms of conditions that change as a consideration of combination. So there are a variable uh integration is Lines, so they're keeping the stable environment, uh, so uh, it's possible that their uh, patent integration has changed over time. Uh, the flat fishes are taking care of that. Uh, there's some early landing flat fishes that are doing engineering and doing some tree. They're looking at uh, published flat integrations. Uh, if they can do uh, near or other positive flat fishes, then it's just follow up on the flat fishes. Can you? 
Yes. So, um, what was the first time that you Awesome talk. Thanks.